Dacryology and update. So dacryology is the study of uh, lacrimal disorders. So we will be seeing in brief what all comes under it. Uh, quick review of the anatomy, what we already know, a few common conditions and what's new, and also some unknown and rare conditions as well. So we shall begin with the first speaker who will be talking about the anatomy, a trip down the theory tract by Dr. Saumya Narayanan. Dr. Saumya is a uh, consultant oculoplastic surgeon at Chandrakant Netralaya and uh, Putalat Eye Hospital, Kurikud. Over to you, Saumya. Good morning. A warm welcome to the, our IC on dacryology. My topic is a trip down the theory tract. So the lacrimal apparatus has a secretory part and an excretory part. The secretory part is mainly by the lacrimal gland, which has a larger orbital part and a smaller palpable part, which is divided by the levator lateral horn. You can see here the lacrimal duct, ducts are passing from the orbital lobe to the palpable lobe. So if you are doing for a biopsy, it's better to take from the orbital lobe to decrease the damage to the lacrimal ducts. There are accessory lacrimal glands, glands of Cruz in the superior form, fornix and glands of Wolfring in the tarsus. And this will also secrete the watery component. There are mebomin glands and congenital goblet cells secreting the other components of the tears and the lacrimal lake is formed. So about the drainage, it starts with the punctum. The punctum is seen in the uh, uh, elevation in the, in the lacrimal papilla. It is 0.2 to 0.3 millimeter in size, posteriorly directed and the inferior punctum is 0.5 to 1 millimeter lateral than the upper punctum. So the, uh, in young patients, the size of the punctum, will, uh, the shape of the punctum will be rounder or oval. With, with aging, there will be re relaxation of the tissues and muscles around the punctum, and the shape will change to slit-like or fish mouth, la later forming to a pinpoint stenotic punctum. So this is the canaliculi. We have a vertical 2 millimeter part and a horizontal 8 millimeter part with the transition is, form, is seen by the ambula, that's the dilated portion. And you can see the surrounding structures to the canaliculi. The important one is the, here the puncti and the vertical portion of the canaliculi is surrounded by the superior muscles of Ryolan. And the lateral one, four fifth of the canaliculi is surrounded by the hornous muscle. With the importance we will talk later. The common canaliculus is a two millimeter structure. The common internal ostium is drained to the sinus of Meyer, that is the laterally bulged portion of the sac. It is opened by the temporal traction of the hornous muscle, and there is a mucosal fold known as the valve of Rosenmuller at that position. So lacrimal sac is divided by the medial candle tendon to fundus, uh, that is a three to five millimeter structure, and a body of 10 millimeter. You can see the posterior and anterior limbs of the medial candle tendon attaching to the uh, posterior lacrimal crest and anterior lacrimal crest. And here in, the, in this picture, you can see the lacrimal sac and the NLD and the, bone is around, the bones around the structures. So the lacrimal fossa is formed by the frontal process of maxilla and the lacrimal bone. And there's a suture in between where we'll start the DCR. And the black star is denoting the suture and author. That is not a suture, but it's a vessel groove. The nasolacrimal duct has a 12 millimeter endrosious part and a 5 millimeter meatal part. And the bony nasolacrimal duct is formed supranasally by the lacrimal bone, infronasally by the inferior turbinate bone, temporally by the maxillary bone. The superior opening is about 6 millimeter in diameter. And there is also a valve known as the Hasness valve. And this is the histology. In the punctum, canaliculi is formed by the stratified squamous epithelium. And there, there we can see a transition from the squamous to columnar. The, the sac is lined by the stratified columnar epithelium with few globular sets. So there are ad, uh, other than valve of Rosenmuller and Heisner, there are other named valves also in the system. The valve of Bostalic and folds in the punctum and other valves in the sac and NLD. So our anatomy of the lacrimal system won't be completed without a nasal anatomy. We can see the lacrimal sac is corresponding to the medial turbinate and the uh, NLD is draining into the inferior meatus. So now about lacrimal drainage. There is a uh, concept called 
scrabial flow, a lacrimal uh, fluid aspiration from the lacus lacrimalis into the punctum continues for a considerable period during eye opening. The aspiration from the punctum relies on the phenomenon of capillary phenomenon and a negative pressure in the canalicular lumen. And there is a pressure gradient from uh, canicul canaliculus to the sac and we can see how the negative pressure is formed. So I, I have already told the lateral four-fifth of the canaliculi is surrounded by the hornous muscle. So during uh, eye closure, the ho hornous muscle will contract and this is contract the canaliculus also. So the tear will drain into the medial one-fifth. That is pulled down by the uh, hornous muscle here. So the tear is drained into that portion. And there is also hornous muscle moves posteronasally here. So that will start from temporal to medial. So it will skewses out the canaliculus and drain into the sac. So the reverse happen in when eye opening. The hornous muscle relaxes along with the relaxation of the lateral four-fifth of the canaliculus and compression of the medial one-fifth. And the tears drain to the, uh, and the tears is pulling in the temporal four-fifth of the canaliculi. And when the eye is closing, hornous muscle relaxes and the sac closes. And when the eye is open, hornous muscle contract and the sac opens. So this is a neurovascular structures around the lacrimal apparatus. We can see the supratrochlear nerve here, infratrochlear nerve, and infraorbital nerve and the external branch of the anterior ethmoidal nerve. These are very important during our DCR and DCT surgeries to give the local anesthesia. And we can also see angular vein here, which is formed by the supratrochlear and supra orbital uh, veins and this is seen usually between the 4 to 8 millimeter from the medial canthus and this is also an important landmark during our DCR and DCT surgery. You can also see the medial palpable artery in that region from the angular vein. Thank you. Thank you so much Saumya for setting up the uh, way for the rest of the speakers. Uh, next we will go uh, with the next topic which is the enigma of CNLDO decoded. We have an invited speaker, Dr. Sonam Nisar, who is a consultant oculoplastic surgeon at the Department of Oculoplasty at Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. Over to you. Thank you, Anju, for that introduction. And at the outset, I'd like to thank the entire team, organizing team of KSOS, as well as Dr. Anju for inviting me here. And my topic for today is Enigma of CNLDO. I cannot start this topic without paying my respects to the gurus of Guru, Dr. Bhadrinath. Uh, I may have not known him as well as a lot of the other fellows, but I'm very proud and I feel privileged to be a part of his legacy at Shankar Netralaya. So my dear friend here, Dr. Soumya, has already spoken very well in detail regarding the anatomy of lacrimal drainage system. So what is CNLDO? Congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. It is one of the most common causes of pediatric epiphora and accounts for about 26% of all disorders of lacrimal system. The most common incidence is higher, the incidence is higher in Down's baby. It is as high as 22 to 36% and that is one thing that we must check while we are assessing Down's children. So CNLDO, to simplify it, is divided into two parts. That is a simple CNLDO and a complex CNLDO. A simple CNLDO just has a membranous obstruction at the valve of Hasner at the level of NLDO. Whereas complex CNLDOs may have a lot of syndromic associations, may have associated atonic sac, analytic ducts, buried probe syndrome, and maldevelopment of NLD as well. So, what do you expect when a patient is coming to you with congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction? Do you see immediate watering discharge? No. The tear secretion starts only approximately between four to six weeks of, I mean, after the child is born. That is approximately 42 days after the child is born. So you will start seeing symptoms as early as one month. So what are the signs and symptoms? Basically, most of the patients that you see come in with their informants. They'll be parents or caregivers. And they'll say they start seeing watering, discharge around one to one and a half months of age. So you'll see watering, discharge, as you see here in this child. You see an increased tearful meniscus height. You see matting of the lashes. You see very subtle periocular excoriation. And you see a mucoid discharge, which is there. Now, you might, you may or may not see a swelling along the lacrimal sac area. And in case of recurrent acute uh, dacryal cystitis, you might even see an associated lacrimal fistula. Or you might see a CNLDO along with a congenital lacrimal fistula as well. 
So it is very important when you see a child with watering or epiphora to distinguish CNLDO from other causes of tearing. It could be punctal atresia, stenosis, conjunctivitis, corneal foreign body, and very notorious congenital glaucoma. So it is very important to do a thorough ophthalmic examination, avert your eyelids, check the corneal diameter, check the IOP. One of my favorite tests in pediatric age group, because children never cooperate for anything, is a FDDT. So you can see, as you see here in the picture, it's a very simple test. You just put one drop of fluorescent dye right into the cul-de-sac and wait for five minutes. When the child is playful, not when the child is crying, otherwise we get false results. So when you see this at the end of five minutes, you see that there is still a dye which is there, right here, compared to the other eye where there is no dye that will indicate that there is some level of obstruction. It is very, very important when you get like one, one and a half year children to look at the puncta because many a times these patients might have one puncta which is missing because that will help us assess and plan our management, in fact, probing much better. Another very standard, very basic in OPD test is Roplas. So what is Roplas? regurgitation on pressure over lacrimal sac area. So this is just a pictorial documentation to tell you how exactly should we do Roplas. Here you see the first line, it indicates the medial canthal tendon. And then you see one line which is going around the inferior medial curve of the uh, orbital rim. So just start from down, from the inferior medial angle, go up towards the MCT and press posteriorly. That is the correct way of doing Roplas. In children, prefer to use a little finger compared to your index finger because uh, they are small, so in little finger is much more efficient when you want to do this. Besides that, you know a lot of studies have also associated CNLDO with anisometropic amblyopia as high as 10 to 12%. So it is very, very essential when you see a six month and older child to do a cycloplegic refraction in order to look for any refractive errors as well. Now, uh, there is an entity which all of us must be aware of, and that is congenital dacryo seal, also known as an amniont seal, because of the fluid that is collected within the sac is the amniotic fluid. Now, this is something that, yes, you will see right from birth. In fact, many scans can actually diagnose this in utero as well. So, as you see here, this is a five-day-old baby who presented with a swelling along the lacrimal sac area. It is generally has a bluish hue. And this you see the patient on day seven of birth. You can see how inflamed and infected this has become. You can also see that there is mucopurulent discharge here. So amniotic fluid, which is present in a dacryo seal, is actually a very good medium for the bacteria. Hence, these patients have recurrent acute dacryocystitis episodes. And that can be very dangerous. Hence, this is one of the indications for an early probing syringing. So here you can see, we took up this patient on day eight after starting a small dose of antibiotics based on the age. The baby was hardly four kgs. And we did just under topical anesthesia, we did a probing under endoscopic guidance. I would like to emphasize this, that all probings that you do should be done under endoscopic guidance because there are many nasal pathologies that can be coexisting with an NLD obstruction. So as you see here, you can see this is an endoscopic picture of this child. You see this is the inferior turbinate that I'm showing with my arrow. But what do you see here, right below the inferior turbinate? It's a huge intranasal cyst, which can be associated with congenital dacryo seals. And this should be marsupialized when you're doing a probing. You would have ordinarily missed this if you were not doing an endoscopic guided probing. Also, this is an uh, ultrasound picture of this child in utero. I am very thankful that we had this picture. And this had already been picked up by the uh, sonologist when the child was actually 36 weeks old. So it helped us plan the treatment much better. Now, a congenital dacryocystitis can just be like an acute, dac I mean, an adult dacryocystitis. It can have stages from a mucosal, then a lacrimal abscess, spontaneous drainage, causing an external fistula. You can have associated preceptal cellulitis, orbital cellulitis, and very rarely orbital abscess. But yes, that can happen in a neglected case of CNLDO. So this was a two-year-old child who presented to us with complaints of watering since birth. And you can see here, you can see all signs, telltale signs of an orbital cellulitis. Imaging showed a picture of an orbital abscess after drainage on day five. Look at how the child is. So these things are something that must be picked up early. And these are a few indications of doing an imaging in a case of CNLDO. 
Now, 80 to 90 percent of these children actually have a spontaneous remission. So we must technically wait for at least 12 to 18 months before we plan any surgical intervention. Now, what do we have to do? You know, if there is a block, there's going to be tears which is going to be uh, collected in the lacrimal sac. Now, any potential dead space is a potential thing for an infection. So most importantly, in order to prevent any acute infection, we must keep on emptying that dead space. That can be done by Krigler's massage. Now, this Krigler's massage goes back 100 years. It was first described by Krigler's in 1923. And it's a very simple thing. I will show it to you how to do that. Um, and we'll talk about management as in when we proceed. So this is a simple video of how to do Krigler's massage in a child. Take your little finger, go all the way up till the lacrimal sac, drain the lacrimal sac, and then press the lacrimal sac. You'll see all the collection coming out from the puncta, and then press it all along the lateral wall of the nose, where your NLD is. It's a very basic anatomical way of doing the massage, emptying the sacs, causing a positive pressure and a negative pressure, in the hope that the membranous block will get opened fast. Now, you may ask, how many times to do this massage? You can advise this massage three to four times a day, 15 strokes each time. So technically around 45 to 60 times. Now you don't want the skin to get really rough, so we advise normally the children to use an anti I mean the parents to use an antibiotic ointment on the little finger and then do the massage. So if Krigler's massage fails and the child is coming to you around uh, 12 to 15 months of age, you can proceed with probing and syringing under endoscopic guidance. But there are few indications of early probing and that one must be well aware of. Now what do you see here in this picture? You see nice congenital cataract here. You also see there is matting of lashes, there is discharge. So a few indications of early probing syringing is recurrent acute dacryocystitis, a dacryocystocele, any impending intraocular surgeries, ROP surgeries, retina surgeries or cataract surgeries. Now this is a quick, uh, I'll just run to this in the interest of time. So normally we do probing only from the upper canal, uh, upper puncta. Why? Because there can be some instances where you can have a punctal split, you can have damage to the canaliculus, and you know that 80 to 90 percent of the drainage is normally from the lower canalicular system. So that is why, in order to preserve that, we normally do the uh, syringing and the uh, probing from the upper puncta. Um, you always must do a syringing after you fi finish a successful probing from the upper puncta because that will tell you from the lower puncta also whether it's patent or not. Um, you just go directly hit the bone, then you rotate 90 degrees, you do a spring test and then you visualize the probe under endoscopic guidance. Um, okay, can I take two more minutes? Okay, so here you can see the probe right at the level of the inferior meatus and then we do a syringing to uh, look for the successful outcome. Uh, I'm just going to rush to this because I've already mentioned about the importance of endoscopic guidance. You can have a buried probe syndrome where you might have a metal on metal touch but you still have the probe which is not coming out into the inferior meatus. That is one of the indications why you should look into endoscopically. Now, if your probing fails, you might want to do an intubation, which could be bicanalicular or monocanalicular. And you might ask me when to remove the intubation tube. That would be at four to six weeks after intubation. Nowadays, with simple probing, we prefer monocanalicular intubation. But if you have complex, then you can choose bicanalicular intubation sets. Uh, this is very common in children and this is called as a spaghetti syndrome because the tube keeps popping out from the carinkle area. Barun dacryoplasty also has been recommended if your probing syringing fails. Uh, the success rates are very variable and I don't have any personal experience with that. But if everything fails, then we resort finally to a DCR, uh, especially in case of atonic sac and where a probing intubation or dacryoplasty has failed. Now you can choose to do an external endoscopic or even a transcanalicular DCR in a pediatric, in a child. So do not uh, hesitate. Only thing is you need to use a pediatric endoscope if you're planning to do a pediatric endo DCR. And there are a few things that you must um, group. Maybe that is beyond the scope of this class. But uh, yeah, that's all. And these are the main few FAQs that people normally ask the role of antibiotics, when to intervene, type of tube uh, intubation, and when to intervene. I hope I've answered most of these questions. And this is a very good review on congenital NLDO which by Aldo et al., which everybody can go back and refer to. Thank you so much. And I would like to actually mention this case scenario. It is a case of Tessier's tube with a rhinia. And the child actually had a cataract in the other eye, which is only seeing eyes. Now, how do you do? What do you do in such scenarios? 
what we did was we went ahead and we did an external DCR and made the opening into the opposite septum so that it tears drain from this side into the, that side. So these are few special considerations that we rarely come across but I wanted to discuss this because these are like grey zones, you don't know what to do but you have to take the best call in the interest of the patient. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Sonam for summing up CNLD in such a beautiful manner with such great pictures Sorry as well. Sorry for overshooting, thanks. Uh, we shall take the questions at the end of the session. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Abarna Batnagar. She, she did her oculoplasty training from Julestein Eye Institute, California and Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. She is currently working in Apollo Hospital and Sri Ramachandra Institute, Chennai. She is a great surgeon as well as a great art artist. She has a bachelor degree in fine arts. A warm welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Anju, for inviting me for this session. And uh, I will start my talk by paying homage to our chief, Dr. Badrinath, who left us uh, with this emptiness. And I pledge that we may carry on forward his legacy of doing ethical practices and service to the humankind. Uh, so my topic is past, present, and future of uh, decryology gadgets. I will not be taking or uh, talking about more of a surgical uh, interventions and procedures, but more of the gadgets or the tools that we use in decryology. So the history starts with the uh, first mention of lacrimal system in the code of Hammurabi dating back to 2250 BC, where it was first described. Uh, the only part which was described later on was the uh, swelling or infection of the lacrimal sac, which was mentioned in fistula in all cases. And the only treatment for this was to burn or cauterize the entire sac. Unfortunately, Renaissance was not uh, uh, that active in research in lacrimal system and it was a little bit laid back. George Stahl suggesting probing for the first time using violin thread. And the first description of probing and syringing was uh, uh, demonstrated by Dominic Anal. So this is how a 18th century lacrimal and dental instrument tray looks like. They even had a silver spoon to cover the eye. Bowman probe that we use is not uh, uh, modified into what we do today. It's, it's as it is as it was described by Bowman in 1851. The first history or historical description of the cryocystectomy was uh, laid out practically destroying the lacrimal sac. So it was not mentioned in a step by manner. The morning DCT was described by Rudolf Berlin in somewhere in 1800s. As we all know, Toti described DCR and its modification in 1904, but interestingly, endonasal uh, procedure was already described some 15, 20 years before. So 20th century, yes, more of modifications and uh, uh, reconstructions and uh, remodifications of instruments were there. Stenting materials from thread to suture to cannula, even putting gauze wicks were very common that time. And silicon intubation has evolved over a period of time. So in the benefit of time, I this is a totally different topic to be discussed in a, another talk. Balloon, decry uh, balloon decryoplasty, as Sonam said, not much experience has been there. And we have done a couple of cases. But the success rate is very variable. And it is not a very, very friendly or very uh, successful procedure. So uh, this is what our current uh, lacrimal uh, uh, instrument tray looks like. Apart from the major instru instruments that we still use, uh, only hammer and chisel have been uh, exchanged by uh, rongeurs and punches. Rest everything almost remains the same. Endoscopes, yes, they are here to stay, originally used in gastroduodenal surgeries. And the basic part of the endoscopic surgery is the telescope, which has never been changed so far. It was described by Hopkins in the late 18s, and only modifications of the endoscopes have been there. So we have all different types and shapes of endoscopes. Then came the laser decryoplasty. Uh, the only disadvantage with this, these procedures were the extreme charring or uh, fibrosis of the tissues, and the recurrence rate was extremely high with these. The next came as micro lacrimal surgeries using a micro drill. The micro drill, if you see, it is attached at the end of the endoscope, and uh, it is used for post-secular uh, stenosis, occlusions, or removing fine membranes, or also debulking of decryolids. 
Lacrimal canalizer, we use it by a different name, uh, canalicular trephination that we all use, still use, it's very easy, it's non-expensive, but people have tried using an electrical recanalizer. I've also included some imaging here because I feel that imaging is a part of the gadget and it has intervened in our surgical procedures, I'll explain to you why. Uh, the first most favored among the conventional x-ray techniques was digital subtraction decryocystography. And why we call it subtraction? Because it eliminates the background images, as you can see, and gives a very clear contrast for lacrimal image for the study. The second came as lacrimal decryoskintigraphy, which was the first radionucleotide evaluation in the system. But if you see, the, it is done in real time and the patient is asked to blink over a period of half an hour. So it, it's a time consuming, but the poor anatomical detail, the resolution of images are extremely poor, makes it a very uncomfortable and unpopular technique. Yes, B-scan mode, as Sonam said, ultrasonography, we have done a lot in the past, we still do, and especially for cases of decryocystocele. Uh, again, lack of anatomical details, inability to accurately localize abnormalities is the drawback. But this is our favorite. This is CT, DCT. I think everybody uses it a lot. And it's an excellent tool for bony structures around the lacrimal gland and bony windows. And now the three-dimensional reconstruction also shows us a little bit of information about the soft anatomical details of the lacrimal system. Likewise, they also tried MRI DC, DCG, same as CT DCG. But then it is, it, has, it is done in a real time, increased motion artifact. It is very difficult to instill the drop installation method once the patient is taken into the MRI room. So this, this is not very common and the cost effectiveness is a drawback. The next is the interior segment OCT. This we have started using in our institute and it's quite uh, helpful using or uh, draining information about the proximal lacrimal system like the stenosis atresia. So with the help of uh, infrared camera, which runs as a green line, if you can see across the maximum diameter of the punctum, we take the OCT images. And what we see, uh, it's very info informative when we are dealing with punctal atresia or stenosis. So the ampulla is seen, is not visible, and sometimes it is present, but it is hidden by a pseudomembrane over the conjunctiva. So these are extremely helpful cases. The next is high definition silo endoscope. Silo endoscope usually is a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, referred or used uh, for salivary duct pathologies. Some people have used as an endoscope for the lacrimal surgeries as well. This is another important tool or gadget, uh, the conventional method and the high definition decryo endoscope or lacrimal endoscope. Uh, this they say is pressure controlled, air insufflated. So they use uh, compressed air instead of the saline irrigation that we use normally for the endoscope. And what they uh, presume is that it yields significantly better image. So if you see uh, image number A and B, the A is with the normal conventional uh, air, uh, irrigation saline which is used and the B is used with the compressed air. The images are much better. In the past, uh, Dr. Havate, if you have met in, uh, Dr. Havate, in the early 2000, he introduced a term called as a ERA DCR where we, he introduced a, a Havate DCR electrodes for uh, endoscopic DCRs. Ultrasonic endoscopic DCR is a very, very promising gadget here because it uses the ultrasonic waves, piezoelectric waves. So there is practically no charring of tissue, no burning, healing is excellent. There is no bleeding and the dissection is extremely very smooth. This is the mainstay and the favorite topic of navigation in all our decryology and oculoplasty conferences. Navigation guide, everybody talks about navigation these days. So what basically we have used the conventional Hopkins telescope, the endoscope is attached to it and there are high degree resolution cameras attached to the endoscopy um, uh, which is done. So at our institute, we use this stealth navigation system. And the beauty of this is that the image which we encounter is in all the three uh, sections. Like you can see the axial coronal and sagittal in the same sitting in the same window along with the endoscopic view. So um, what happens when you have an endoscopic procedure going on, we have these windows which are, uh, you can see all the three sections along with the endoscopic view and along with the dummy um, 
probe which is the which is the red color probe in the fifth window and you can actually go for a facial reconstruction in the same setting so once you know you are in the right direction absolutely spot on then we can remove all the windows and carry on with the procedures so there is talking about the navigation there is this is one step ahead of navigation which is called as a look ahead software so in look ahead software we have the benefit uh, if you see these are four windows and we have the benefit of anticipating the next anatomical structure which is going to be or we are, which we are going to face as our uh, uh, during our procedure so let me explain this is the endoscopic view through the center of the lacrimal sac so if you see the first image is right at, corresponding to the endoscopic view but the next three windows will show us the next anatomical structures which will come at the length of 5, 10 and 15 millimeter. So if you are contemplating an angular vein or suppose you are contemplating major vessel, you can be guard, guard yourself. The next is CTDCG along during the endoscope itself, you can go, you can instill the dye in the cul-de-sac and you can do your surgeries along with the CTDCG in real time. Uh, another advancement is if you have a 3D CTDCG that is even better because it gives you a bone window and a soft, tickle, uh, soft tissue alignment at the same time. So lastly just one minute extra, the future as we are talking about no talk can be complete without artificial intelligence that is a must these days. So it's an umbrella term for all computer software based algorithms and it has two component of AI, the machine learning and the deep learning. And while I was Googling AI and ophthalmology, I came across so many lecture uh, papers regarding uh, AI in um, ophthalmology, but only one paper for lacrimal apparatus. The second and the last is the robotic. So any other talk will not go without the robotic thing. Robotic apparatus or positioning system, as we can see, and they have actually done in three patients using robotic limbs, uh, endoscopic DCR. Um, and the last one is the voice command and control lacrimal surgeries. So I could not find any lacrimal surgery for voice controlled, uh, I mean, uh, procedures. But we have had some research in vitreo retinal surgeries where the voice command, the instruments are made use of. So to wind up, the past is a kind enough to give you lessons. The present is kind enough to give you opportunities. The future is kind enough to give you both. Rest is in our hands, how we choose it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Aparna, for having coming this far in spite of having a viral fever and taking us through that beautiful journey from the past to the present. So uh, now our next speaker, Dr. Marian Polly, who needs no introduction, will be, she'll be talking to us about routine DCR and unexpected surprises. Over to you, madam. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anju. Uh, see, I'm just going to put some cases which I have come across. So DCR, unexpected surprises, what we see is either it's an anatomical surprise or a pathological surprise. So anatomy, uh, <clears throat> so first is when you dissect the sac, the next is to, uh, you have to enter into the nose, that is lateral wall of the nose. So when you, in that step, you can have ethmoid coming into it. So at that point of time, you will be confused because uh, the ethmoid bone is very thin and second, uh, it is uh, to differentiate it from lacrimal sac mucosa, ethmoid bone is very thin. Then the mucosa is also thin and uh, it is less vascular and less adherent to bone also. So when I initially come across, because there is a racial variation, even in South, I think. When I did fellowship, I didn't come across much ethmoids. But when I'm operating in this uh, Cochin, I come across uh, around 30% of anterior ethmoids. But when I look into the literature, around 46% had this anterior ethmoid. It has been radiologically studied also, but so radiologically around 59.23% had uh, uh, ethmoids coming to in the way of your uh, ostium. So this, we have to be very careful and uh, the main thing is to differentiate between the lacrimal mucosa, lacrimal sac mucosa, I mean nasal mucosa and ethmoid sinus mucosa. So this is the nasal mucosa and you can see the thickness of the nasal mucosa, it's very thick, but ethmoid mucosa is very thin. So this is one anatomical surprise. So coming to second anatomical surprise, we know the normal anatomy, 
uh, upper canaliculus, lower canaliculus joints and form the common canaliculus. But uh, in this, uh, this I have not come across, but reported by Dr. Javed, that is distinct canalicular openings into the lacrimal sac without a common canaliculus. Even though this is uh, not very problematic, you have the take home message is you have to probe both the canaliculus to see the patency, whether it is opening to the uh, sac. So now coming to the pathological surprises. So this is a four year old child uh, presented with a recurrent lacrimal abscess and IND, he had already undergone IND four times in the past from elsewhere. Uh, probing also done two, three times. And the parents are repeatedly telling me it is uh, syringing is patent. So now, uh, now what to do? And he is four years now, but not willing for dacrocystogram, which will give me some clues. You can see the scar and this is the clinical picture. So what I did is, I, since I am seeing the child for the first time, I also posted him for probing syringing, plus minus uh, DCR, because I have already discussed and have taken consent also. So now intraoperatively, uh, any guesses? So this was a case of lacrimal sac diverticulum. It's rarely seen, but uh, this repeat, uh, repeat INDs and the patent on probing, uh, the patent on syringing, you think about lacrimal sac diverticulum. So actually I have entered into the pouch and then uh, eventually I did DCR for him. And he did well. So this is another case, uh, 50 years female, um, I did DCR for NLDO. Intraoperatively, the sac was abnormally very much thickened. So I was just wondering what is, so I did a biopsy and turned out to be sarcoidosis. So while after the surgery on the one week review, while I was asking the history, she was taking uh, treatment for chronic asthma, I mean chronic cough, thinking it as chronic asthma. Eventually, she was diagnosed to have systemic sarcoidosis, and this we have published by Dr. Shebin in IJO. So, intraoperatively thickened sac, always do biopsy. The other part, which very commonly missed condition is lymphoma also. Coming to my fifth case, so he's a 50-year-old medical practitioner. Uh, came for DCR because he's already a doctor, so he knows what pathology is going on. So, on examination, you can see there is a mucosy-like thing well below the middle candle tendon, displacing the lid up. Uh, the globe is also a little pushed up. And I did syringing. Syringing showed an atonic sac. So since uh, I did an image, because there was, you can feel a mass here, but it's not very typical of uh, mucosin. So CT scan showed a mass, but the sac was seen separately from the mass. And you can see a mass here. And on the other side, he has got an uh, ethmoidal mucosal also. But the, interestingly, the na nasal anatomy is grossly disturbed. So I took an ENT consultation, and uh, they said nothing to be done from the other side. Uh, ethmoidal mucosal is not causing any problem. You can go ahead with your management. So intraoperatively, the mass was distinct, and I did an excisional biopsy with lacrimal intubation. The mass was actually pushing the sac, causing uh, pseudo NLD, causing a tonic sac. And histopathology turned out to be cholesterol granuloma. So this was also an intraoperative surprise, even though I was expecting something in the preoperative evaluation. Uh, coming to the sixth case, uh, again 50-year-old, uh, insisted mucosal came for DCR. Uh, so you can see this is the clinical picture. There is a mass below the middle candle tendon. Uh, only thing, uh, the mass was little firm, and so we did a CT scan. <coughs> reported as infected retention cyst, but you can see a bone uh, scalloping. So in this case, we were a little confused. This is, does, doesn't look like uh, this thing, I mean, DCR, uh, row plus NLD. So in, what we have done is posted for DCR versus DCT, depending on the frozen section. So uh, when we opened, it was little thick. So we did a frozen section and turned out to be plasma cell neoplasm, based on which we did DCT and turned out to be lacrimal plasma cytoma. So this was also an intraoperative surprise, and he did well with the, with the 10 years follow-up now. Coming to the seventh case, 48 years female, uh, diagnosis uh, had already undergone endoscopic DCR with the face twice by the ENT surgeon, and she's a known case of treated costroma breast. So this is her, cl her clinical picture with uh, incisor mucosal with inflammation above the middle candle tendon. This is, this is her CT scan picture. You can see the already uh, done ostium is already there, but her sinuses are also full. 
So again, I took an ENT consultation because uh, even actually referred from ENT, still I took an again a repeat ENT consultation. And uh, this was, uh, even though posted for DCR, initially we did DCR and later failed and finally we did DCT. It turned out to be a fungal granuloma and she was given systemic antifungals. So this was another surprise, 46 years NLDO. I posted for, for DCR, it was one late evening. So after, uh, this was her first, after the incision, it was started bleeding heavily. So I thought I will post, and she was uncooperative. So I thought I'll just post her under GA on a later date. So when she came back after two weeks, it was like this. Any guesses? So this was a case of uh, rhinosporidiosis. And then I did DCT and she did well. So to avoid pathological surprises, we had to do biopsy like sac thickening. We had to uh, do biopsy when sac thickening, abnormal discoloration, irregular mucosal surface, any systemic diseases like autoimmune, malignancy, sarcoid, veganous, lymphoma, leukemia, all these things you have to ask before you take up the patient for a DCR. And any failed DCR, then again suspicion based on history, scans, nasal endoscopy and intraoperative findings. Uh, Clinical significance of routine lacrimal sac biopsy during DCR uh, is already been in 3,865 3, lacrimal sac specimens. Specific pathology was found in 5% of cases. This slide is very, very important. I will just stop with this slide. This is how taken from Dr. Identity Singh's pathology textbook. Each line he has written is very, very important. I will take one 30 seconds. So maintain a high level of how to avoid surprises during DCR. One, maintain a high level of suspicion. Examine the reflex from, irritation of, from irrigation of the lacrimal system. Press on the sac. Beware of firm, incompressible, immobile masses. Press on the sac. Examine for any blood stain tears. Uh, beware of a mass above MCT. Perioperatively, if the sac looks like anything other than inflamed sac, obtain a biopsy. Perform a nasal examination. Beware of skin ulceration, tailing trictasia. In the presence of lacrimal sac max, examine for lymph, lymph nodes. If in doubt about the appearance of the sac, do biopsy. In the presence of DCR being performed on a patient with history of lymphoma, leukemia, always biopsy. So to conclude, expect the unexpected, careful preoperative, tackle intraoperative surprises, excellent outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marian, for the interesting talk, as always. Next, last talk is by Dr. Anju Chandran. She did her oculoplasty training from Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. And currently, she is working in Compress Thai Hospital, Calicut. Uh, thank you, Samia. So coming to the last talk, so, so far we have been listening to talks which are common. I'll be dealing with a little uncommon uh, conditions, but which also results in tearing for the patient. So not uh, apart from nasolacrimal duct obstructions, I'm going to take you through some conditions. I'll be dealing with the disorders of the puncta and the canaliculi. So uh, you would have come across this condition, which is the absence of puncta, also known as punctal agenesis. It can involve just a single puncta or both the puncta. Usually the patient is asymptomatic unless and until it is associated with a, with a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. There are several other ocular abnormalities that the, those are associated with it, which you need to be aware of and look for as well. And it's seen in systemic conditions such as ectodermal dysplasias. Most often it's just observation, probing only if you're suspecting an associated NLD obstruction. And in cases where uh, probing fails, then it's DCR with a monocanalicular intubation. So uh, until I came across this entity, which was diagnosed very recently, I used to wonder why this patient has a puncta, but there's something over it which looks like a thin membrane. So it was described by Dr. Javed Ali, which is called incomplete canalization of the puncta. It is basically punctal dysgenesis with membranes and it presents usually in the first decade. So if you look closely on the slit lamp, you'll be able to make out an avascular dimple at the site of the puncta and on through making a very small slit, you can make out a very translucent membrane which can be present either within or externally. Ma management is quite simple. You just need to do a membrane uh, membranotomy with tapered punctum dilator with which the patient's symptoms are relieved most often because the rest of the canaliculi is always normal. So anything in this picture that stands out? How many puncta are there? Two, yeah. So this is a condition of supernumerary puncta, which are usually uh, the patient uh, presents to you only when there is an associated uh, condition like a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. 
So most of our OPDs are flooded with patients who complain of watering and you will definitely not miss this, which is a punctal stenosis. It's basically an acquired condition where the external opening of the canaliculus is narrowed or occluded, may or may not be associated with canalicular wall stenosis as well. So the causes are numerous, such as in aging, infectious conditions that affect the conjunctiva, eyelid, and uh, very commonly in topical medications, you will get reference from your glaucoma counterparts, and patients who are on systemic medications, especially for uh, oncology purposes. And th there are several other uh, uh, conditions like malposition, trauma, and so on. So there are grades that have been described, which are for academic purposes. Just to put them up for uh, you to see and know. Treatment options are only if the patient is symptomatic. And earlier uh, it was described that you could do a one snip, or two snip, or three snip punctoplasty. But slowly the uh, trend has shifted towards punctum dilatation with a monocanalicular intubation. This is to preserve the integrity of the puncta so that the physiology is not tampered with. There have been uses of uh, perforated punctal plugs, which uh, there are chances of the plugs being lost and the outcome not being very good. So uh, recently, a, a, a colleague asked me that I saw this in a patient. What should I do about it? Should I observe? So I believe that any growth that is recent has to be excised and be sent for a biopsy, because it can be either a benign lesion, such as a melanotic nevus, a squamous papilloma, epidermoid cyst or hydrocystoma, and you may not be, uh, you shouldn't be surprised if you even get malignant lesions such as a sebaceous gland carcinoma, a squamous cell carcinoma, and rarely malignant melanoma as well. So this was a 75-year-old gentleman. So when you see a patient like this in the OPD, the first thing to do is you need to probe and see if the canalicula is intact, and you can also follow it up with syringing to see if it is free. So once that is assured, then the next step is to excise it. And when you excise as well, make sure that you have a probe in place so that you excise it around at the base. And then follow it up with a monocanalicular intubation. My favorite is the mini monoca, which is trimmed and inserted into the canaliculus. Leave it for about four weeks, and the patient will come back to you saying that the watering has reduced, and uh, the puncta heals almost always very e neatly. So quickly through the disorders of the canaliculi, this was one gentleman who kept complaining of uh, discharge and watering over a year. He went to multiple doctors. He said that he was given topical antibiotics, but no relief of symptoms. So if you look closely at the picture, the left upper puncta and the associated region, it is inflamed and he had classically what is called the pouting puncta. On manual expression, you get concretions, so which is a telltale sign of the condition, can canaliculitis. So um, I've covered the presenting signs. The causative organisms are usually actinomycetes, streptococci, and staphylococci. So because of the presence of concretions, most often the uh, medications do not reach the canaliculi where the pathology lies. So it is important to do a punctal dilatation and to cure it out all the uh, concretions. Uh, it is divided as to you can do a punctal sparing canaliculotomy or you can do a punctoplasty with curatage but I prefer a punctum sparing one. This is followed by warm compressors and antibiotics. Just quickly at this very recent uh, condition that was uh, described, which is called idiopathic canalicular inflammatory disorder. There are a series of stages that the patient goes through, which is initial progressive edema, then vascularization, then pouting of the vascularized mucosa, membrane formation, and eventually progressive cicatrization. If you look at the criteria, one thing is negative uh, microbiology workup and negative systemic involvement. There is a relentless disease progression and the disease response to steroids. So uh, the treatment would be a punctum dilatation with a mini monoca intubation at least for four weeks. You start the patient on uh, tapering topical steroids and follow it up with topical cyclosporin for at least a minimum of three months to get the adequate response. Just a quick mention about canalicular injury, which is all uh, you should look for this, especially in lid tears, which are medial to the puncta. And it has to be repaired properly with a, a stent in place for at least three weeks again, so that you can restore both anatomical as well as functional integrity for the patient. 
Canalicular blocks, you usually get this in your OPD. You will have regurgitation of clear fluid from the same puncture. Uh, this need not be addressed unless the patient has an associated NLD obstruction. Common canalicular block, I will finish with this slide. So what you would find is regurgitation of clear fluid on syringing, which need not be an NLD obstruction. You should always do a probing to confirm whether it is an NLD obstruction or a common canalicular block. In this case, you will get what is called a soft stop. Uh, some other rare conditions, which are canalicular ops and canalicular wall aplasia. So I cannot end a topic or I see on dacryology without mentioning this great man, Dr. Mohammed Javed Ali, who has contributed so much to dacryology and uh, his textbooks are up here for you to read if you have a special interest in dacryology. Thank you. So now we are open to questions. Anybody, any doubts? So um, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Aparna. In which all conditions would you advise uh, CT, DCG? Thanks, Sanju. Um, sorry if I have a bad throat. So DC, uh, CT, DCG, almost in all those conditions where you are likely to diagnose as a canalicular obstruction, um, or uh, secondary nasolacrimal duct obstruction, <clears throat> secondary to trauma, or if you are planning a plastic reconstruction of a post-traumatic, uh, like if uh, usually the cases which we do are in conjunction or in association with the plastic team. So uh, sometimes what we feel they are not very particular on the sac area while reconstruction, so we need to kind of bring to their notice that canaliculus and lacrimal system is as important as in a reconstruction of the lacrimal, uh, of the plastic reconstruction. So in all secondary NLDOs, in traumatic, in uh, canalicular obstructions, these would be my favorite. Uh, again, if you are suspecting a lacrimal sac tumor or a medial canthal mass, better to do a CT DCG to find out whether the lacrimal system is involved or not. So the sac and the dye, if you give, if the sac is not involved, the medial mass is either posterior or too anterior to the lacrimal system, that will be delineated very beautifully on CTDCG. So that you can be well assured that, okay, you are not dealing with a lacrimal tumor. These are the cases. Thank you. I have a question to Dr. Marian, madam. Uh, how uh, do you, advocate a nasal endoscopic examination in all patients prior to uh, external in DCR? All the patients you have to do nasal endoscopic examination because it's very, very important. Atrophic rhinitis, tumors, everything. Uh, what I, since we don't have an endoscope, I usually use 20D. Uh, you can see almost up to the middle turbinate in many of the cases. But uh, slowly we are getting endoscope. So far we didn't have any problem less because I don't have an endoscope. I mean, I don't know. But uh, Always be examined, yeah. Okay. But only thing, uh, post-op, um, if you get a tube retraction, like in that cases, sometimes only in the last 12 years, I need to refer only one patient to an END surgeon just because the tube got retracted up. So he retrieved the tube for me. Otherwise, the last 12 years, I didn't regret that. I, I, ha I didn't have an endoscope. But we are getting endoscope shot. We never refer to the END surgeon. We do... Uh, about my theory is if you have a nasal cavity, you can do an external DCR. If you have a nasal cavity, the case that you, sh you showed with there is no nasal cavity, you have to do to the other side. You have to, uh, yeah, uh, that is the only case in which maybe an ENT surgeon was required. Otherwise, we don't refer. There is no, even in atrophic rhinitis, there is a nasal cavity, there is a nasal mucosa. I am, I, I'm, I <laughs> Is there a you know why we are not failure in atrophic huh? rhinitis, madam, when we do a DCR? I have never encountered. I no. may be doing, I don't know, last year when we took the thing, I was doing so many cases per year, but we have never encountered. What is atrophic rhinitis? There is a nasal mucosa. If there is a nasal cavity, there is a nasal mucosa. Okay. Actually, we had a discussion with uh, my classmate. She's an END surgeon. You can do DCR in atrophic yeah. rhinitis. Just treat the nose before it and do DCR. No need of DCT. No, no. Yeah. yeah. And DCT, even in cases of rhinosporidiosis, where does the, where does the uh, rhinosporidium enter? 
through the inferior turbinate. So it's already in the nasal mucosa, the rhinosporidium. So the ENT surgeon told me on the table when I asked him, uh, should you, should I uh, do a DCT in case of rhinosporidium? He said, you do a DCR because otherwise the patient will end up with watering and then we can't do anything. So do a DCR, we'll treat the nose later. So I don't know, even in cases of, uh, because it's already in the nose. So why should you do a DCT and uh, end up with watering? In all cases, even if the patient is 90 year old, we do a DCR. Because even 90 is now young, they can't uh, uh, end up with watering. We do a DCR in all cases. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that. Any, any more? No, I just wanted to emphasize that endoscopic uh, evaluations is important in especially traumatic DCRs because you might have a low-lying skull base, you might have a fracture at the level of the cribriform, you might end up uh, you know, having a CSF leak sometimes if you don't know your anatomical position. So I think these things, plus if you're suspecting a tumor, like such beautiful cases you actually showed. So we had a case of SFT going right into the NLD. So with endoscopic this thing, we were able to clear the entire tumor and give RT. So these few conditions, I personally feel it's easier. <laughs> In traumatic cases, a CT is enough if you want to see a low-lying base of skull or anything. Why, how will a surgeon, ENT surgeon know from the, when you go through the bottom, where the CSF floor is and all. You can take a CT and see, no? We had a very, very active ENT surgeon who took all the cases from us. So after that, I never, and I, after that, Good I have never regretted doing, uh, not doing an uh, ENT consultation. Thank you, madam. Uh, now, for the invited speakers, I request uh, Dr. Annie Madam to please hand over a momento. Call upon Dr. Aparna to please receive the memento. Next, I call upon Dr. Uh, Sonam to please get the memento from Dr. Ani. We can finish the session with a quick group photo with the speakers.